On Wednesday, November 10th, 2021, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Migratory Birds Program in the Pacific Northwest Columbia region held a birding panel titled, What is it about birding? The intent of the panel was to share the joys of birding from a panel of experienced birders, as well as new birders who were just getting started. The panel was composed of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and was intended to create a sense of belonging and community for people of color. Panelists included moderator Mauricio Baladrian, Brenda Ramirez, Jazz Friels, Lily Calderon, and Sam DeJarnette. During the video, you'll notice that audience members were asked to fill out polls for trivia questions. Jazz announces the responses with the most votes, followed by the correct answer. We hope you enjoy it. Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm so excited that you're all here. Thank you for taking the time out of this evening. I know that um, we have a big holiday tomorrow, so this is a lot to take your time to come and join us to talk about getting outside and doing some bird watching. My name is Nanette Sito and I work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We're happy to bring you here together with several birders, new and experienced, to share with you their stories and how they started their bird watching journey. But before we continue, I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, I wanted to let you all know that this meeting is being recorded so that we can share this discussion with a broader audience after tonight. Also, you might have noticed that you have joined the meeting muted and with cameras off. But if you do have questions, don't hesitate to put them into the chat box. We'll monitor your questions and we'll address them later in the evening. If you need closed captions, you can turn them on by looking at the live transcript button down at the bottom of your screen and selecting subtitles on. And also, if you put your view window on presenter mode, you'll get the best viewing of our panelists tonight. And near the end of the discussion, we'll be um, sharing some information if you live in the Portland area on an opportunity that you can have to go on a bird outing. And if you do need to leave the session a little early tonight, we'll actually put a link to where you can sign up for those bird outings in the chat. So that way you don't get, you don't miss that opportunity. Now, now I am happy to introduce our moderator for the night, Mauricio Valadrian. Mauricio is the founder of Valadrian Creative and Consulting a consulting firm and media production house located here in Portland, Oregon. The company develops comprehensive marketing and outreach strategies with a focus on connecting underrepresented communities to public lands. Thank you, Mauricio, for joining us tonight. Thank you, thank you, Annette. Yay! Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. And thank you all for being here. I see so many folks out there. So happy to see all. And of course, happy to be talking about birding. What is it about birding? I've, I, this is a notion that is very, very new to me. And the more I get to know about it, the more I get to meet wonderful people like our panelists today. And yeah, I'm just excited to get started. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, introduce our star panelists this evening. I'm gonna start with Brenda Ramirez. Uh, Brenda grew up in sunny Novo, California. Her family didn't go to wild spaces very often. So she found connection with nature in the little things such as her mother's house plants. While she still takes joy in all the little things such as birds and flowers, her main interest is in how, how nature connects us all. She did not always see someone who shared her identities represented as the outdoorsy type. So she's driven to create spaces where folks from underrepresented communities can share stories and be in community with each other and nature. Welcome, Brenda. Good to see you here. Next up, we have Lily Calderon. She fell into the world of birds after acquiring her first pair of binoculars her last semester in college in between various field jobs and internships focused on birds. Lily decided to make avian conservation the center of her career. 
She earned a master's degree studying bird migration at the University of Delaware, and shortly after was hired by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. In her new position, Lily focuses on avian conservation, along with sharing her passion for birds with systematically excluded communities. Lily, so glad to have you. Next, we have the amazing Sam de Jeanette. I just put a little French flair to it. I hope that's okay. <laughs> she has been birding for three years, and after leaving the world of conservation, she started the Always Be Burden podcast, amazing podcast to uplift Black, Indigenous, and people of color birding voices and highlight the passion we as folks of color find in birding and conservation. She works hard towards creating a new birding community that truly reflects her motto, no matter who you are or where you are, you can always be birding. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Sam. Uh, and by the way, uh, these bird outings were the ones that um, Nanette was making uh, reference to. We will have links for uh, you folks to join in and of course to share with others other folks of color that like to try out this birding thing. And last, one of the main stars of this evening, Jazz Frills. Jazz, age 12, was born in Haiti and moved to the United States when he was five. He goes to Cracksburger Middle School and will begin seventh grade this fall. Jazz has been taking photos ever since his mom gave him a camera about three years ago. He especially enjoys taking photos of wildlife and his pets. His favorite thing to do when he's not exploring and taking pictures or playing sports, building things with Legos and reading. And as a special treat today, Jazz has a little video clip that he'd like to share before we move on to this excellent uh, activity that he's got prepared for us. So Lev, if you wouldn't mind sharing that video with us, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Jazz and I'm 12 years old. I started watching and photographing birds at home where we have a green space in our backyard. We have woodpeckers, stellar jays, scrub jays, cedar waxwings, crows, dark-eyed juncos, finches, gross beaks, wrens, robins, chickadees, bush tits, flickers, hummingbirds, and more. And sometimes even hawks and owls. One time we even had a bald eagle in our neighborhood. There are many places to go birding, rivers, lakes, the beach, nature parks, and especially wildlife refuges. For birding, I always take my binoculars, camera, and water bottle. And sometimes I like to pick up a walking stick while I explore. What I enjoy about watching birds and all wildlife is seeing how they behave. And with my binoculars, I can see unique physical features. One of my favorite bird moments was watching some osprey chicks in a nest by the river. The chicks were flapping their wings and hopping as they practiced to fly. My mom even got some videos of that moment. I think it's important for people to get out and enjoy nature. The more we learn about nature, the more we will want to protect it. Thank you, Lev. Amazing. Check it out, our new David Attenborough. I can see it. I can see you there, Jess, just so you know. All right, now for one of the highlights of our evening, Jazz has a trivia set for us to participate on. And Jazz, take it away. All right, thank you. All right. Here we go to the, all right, thank you. So first question is, how do you tell the difference between an adult and female osprey and adult male osprey? A, adult female ospreys usually have more brown feathers on their breasts or bib than males. B, adult male ospreys are usually more, bigger than the males. Females. I meant females. C, adult males have blue eyes and females have yellow eyes. D, both A and B. All right, folks, now it's time to enter your answers. All right, here we go. Slowly, we're starting to see those answers trickling to our trivia question number one, about 52% of them. All right, we're going to give folks a few more seconds to... to Choose one of these options. There we go. Right. Okay. The Same suspense way. is killing us all. Is that right? <laughs> yes. About sixty-five percent. Keep putting your answers, folks. There we go. Let's put it ten more seconds, and then we'll just get to wherever how many folks responded, anyways. Three, two, one. Here we go. Let's see what the results are. Looks like a lot of you said that 
A. Looks like a lot of you chose A. Were you correct? Answer is A. Adult female ospreys usually have more brown on their breast or bib. In addition, female ospreys are usually larger than the males. Next question. Next question. True or false, hummingbirds are the only birds that can fly backwards for any length of time. A, true, B, false. All right, true now, it's, false. now it's time to enter your answers. Oh. <laughs> All right, we're getting there. I think we're getting there. True or false? Well, off the bat, we're already getting more answers than the last question. All right, here we go. Almost there. All right, here we go. These are the results. Looks like a lot of you said true. Were you correct? Answer is true. The hummingbird is the only bird that can fly backwards for any amount of time. Hummingbirds flap their wings as fast as 12 to 80 beats per second, allowing them to fly backwards, upside down, up, down, forward, side to side, and also hover. Some other birds can fly backwards, but only briefly. Thank you, Jess. Next way. A group of crows is called A, party, B, unkindness, C, squad, D, murder. All right, now it's time to enter your answers. All right, and here as an extra bit of uh, interesting information, all the pictures that you see in this presentation are pictures from Jazz. So you get to also witness his dexterity in the uh, photo camera lens. All right, where are we? 82%, a few more folks joining with the answers. Some actually went back. Some actually changed their mind. <laughs> Okay. All right, here we go. Looks like a lot of you chose D, were you correct? Answer is D, a group of crows is called a murder. The origin of this is from old folk tales and superstitions because crows are scavengers and are often associated with death. Next question. True or false, a woodpecker's tongue is so long it must store it in the back of its head. A, true, B, false. Just, I'm just picturing what this tongue in the back of the wedding, <laughs> I, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, here are the results. Looks like a lot of you said true. Were you correct? Answer is true. A woodpecker's tongue is so long it must store it in the back of its head between the skull and skin. Hummingbirds do the same with their tongues. Thank you. And also, before we move too far, I saw Sam's comment about a crow's being a party. A party of crows, that's a party that I would like to join. Thank you there, Sam. <laughs> All right, moving on to your next question. True or false, tricky vultures have bald heads. A, true, B, false. All right, now it's time to enter your answers. All right, all right. Now, I think folks are warming up. <laughs> I see those answers coming in faster and faster each time. Yeah. All right. Row gain for turkey vultures. That's <laughs> that's the new nonprofits. And here we go. The results. Looks like a lot of you said true. Were you correct? Turkey. The answer is true. Turkey vultures are bald. Close up, a turkey vulture resembles a turkey, hence its name. The bald head prevents carrion bits from sticking to the turkey vulture's head. And okay. Next question. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> True or false, the great horned owl will often borrow a vacant nest, nest built by another bird. A, true. B, false. All right, now it's time to enter your answers. <laughs> Bold is beautiful, Veronica said. I'm sure many folks here agree. Nicely done. All right, 75%. Just a few more folks. Man, you guys are getting much quicker. There we go. Nice work, Jazz. All right, I'm gonna just go ahead and share the results. Here we go. 
Looks like a lot of you said true. Were you correct? Great horned owls will answer is true. Great horned owls will often borrow empty nests created by other birds. They will also use cavities in live trees, dead snags, cliff ledges, man made platforms, and even deserted buildings. Next question. Nicely done. Nicely done. A black capped chickadee's memory is so good that it can remember where it has stored food in how many places? A, hundreds, B, millions, C, thousands, D, trillions. Trillions, for sure. Easily. 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 <laughs> Thank you for those supporting my hypothesis. <laughs> all right, all right. And here are the results. Looks like a, a lot of you chose A. Were you correct? Answer is C, a black capped chickadee's memory is so good it can remember it has stored seeds and other food. Each item is placed in different spots and the chickadee can remember thousands of hiding places. That's crazy. <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing. There you go. Here we go. Next question. Once a year in the summer, Canada geese molt and can't fly for A, four weeks, B, six weeks, C, 10 days, D, none of the above. All right, now it's time to enter your answers. If, if the moderator remembered to launch that poll, that would be a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, here we go, here we go. Lots of folks right away. I think people have very strong feelings about this time range. And here are the results. Most of you said six weeks or 10 days. Let's see which one of you was correct. Answer is B, once a year in the summer, Canada geese molt and can't fly for six weeks. This makes them more vulnerable to predators. Retreating to water plays an important role in their survival during this time. Wow, okay. That's the end of that. Now, how about a round of applause for Jazz? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lots of things that I didn't know. Some perhaps that I probably did not know I wanted to know. I definitely uh, will consider getting my head shaved for more uh, hygienic eating. Thank you, Turkey Vulture. Now, uh, Jazz is going to stay with us for the remaining of the time uh, as we have this conversation about what is it about burning and uh, people, folks of color and what that experience has been like. So thank you, Jazz, again. And with that, let's go ahead and start this conversation with these premeditated questions that have been provided by me with premeditation. So main question here for all of us, and of course, feel free to uh, chime in whenever you want to. So I'll preface by saying that the whole reason why we're doing this is because birding is, feels like a thing that a lot of people of folks don't know anything about. And so now that we have the, um, the, uh, the uh, suerte, the, how lucky we are that, uh, that we have you here, I'd love to know how you all got into birding. What, how was that journey? Where did it begin? So whomever wants to take that on, please go ahead. Who's going to go first? I you don't mind. Point match you? Okay, Lily, go ahead. Yeah, I think it, uh, people ask me this all the time because they come to my house and I have all these bird posters. I'm like, oh, you really like birds, huh? And like, how did that happen? So I think I've always had an interest for birds. I grew up in Chicago and I have a big family. I have five brothers, so things can be hectic at home. I just remember sitting down in the back steps and looking at morning doves and just finding some peace in them. And then <laughs> common birds, right? They're beautiful. And um, so then that was it. Growing up, I just loved them. And then in college, I took an ornithology class and I thought it was so much fun. I was learning how to bird watch like in college and my parents saw how much I enjoyed it. And they bought me this huge clunky pair of binocular, binoculars. We didn't know how to shop for them. We just like, that looked good and that's what I got and it exploded from there and I just say I'm not looking back I love birds so much mm -hmm. and this was just looking outside the window from your home and this was in, in a city right yeah yep. 
Yeah, that's very interesting. Okay, L love that story. I'm gonna start just pointing. Oh my gosh, Lily, I am so glad you brought up morning doves because that was my introduction to birding. Um, and like, it was kind of the same same deal. Um, I, I also have a big family and um, I was also kind of like the weakling of the family. And so I just remember there being days where I couldn't like run with everybody and I couldn't play with everybody. And bird watching was kind of that thing that I kind of fell into by accident. Like I was just kind of like sitting back because I couldn't keep up with everybody else. And I saw these morning doves and I saw like just by accident, cause I, I loved reading and I saw in an encyclopedia, the picture of the bird that was in my yard. And I was just like, morning I had to look at what morning was and it was like it's crying not like morning of the daytime bird um and so it was just really cool and it's it's been incredible to go from this thing that I loved as a kid to um it really coinciding with um seeing myself outdoors like it, it just went hand in hand because it was this thing that I could do while I was still learning to hike and be outdoors for long periods of time. Like, it didn't matter if I couldn't keep up. Like, I get to look at this bird for like 10 minutes, you know, and then mm -hmm. keep going, catch my breath, keep going. And um, it, it's incredible. And, um, and it's been just this big source of uh, like community for me too, because that's how I met you and just, um, it's just it's been such a launch into getting outdoors and finding jobs in, in the outdoors as well so um yeah it's it's just a lot of fun and i'm so glad i get to do it to this day <laughs> you, you you can't tell there's no passion behind this it's like they say birds and all these big smiles just pop on screen right away i see veronica's uh, comment as well that you don't have to go very far to get in touch with nature that is such an important thing to remember you know we have this well-defined idea of what being outdoorsy is supposed to look like and unfortunately media has not done a great job at having a lot of like representation of folks that aren't from dominant culture doing that thing and so uh, it is it is it is just so beautiful to see how this connection to nature is so inherent in all of us and it's like all of a sudden it's like this spark goes off and then you see like ah and i think this is the perfect way to it i saw that you sam had something to say about this because i and i know your journey has always also been pretty interesting on this yeah mine was kind of uh complicated and complex but not really at the end of the day um i didn't know anything about birds i grew up loving animals so like that's a wrap right i'm here for it went to school for zoology my advisor was like, you should do wildlife rehabilitation. And I was like, what's that? Sure. And lo and behold, I fell in love with birds there. But when I was in Ohio, where I'm from, when I moved out here, I started working for Portland Audubon doing wildlife rehabilitation. And everyone there went birding. And I was like, what is, what is that? Like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> People go look for birds. That seems weird. And so I went and I remember going to Steigerwald and that was the first place that we went. And that's my favorite place. Um, and I remember seeing this like mallard, male mallard, just like booking it across this pond freaking out just like oh no oh no oh no and this bald eagle was like this close behind it and I was like ah! I like start freaking out because I'd never seen anything like that before um and then it's just ever since then I was like wow this is really cool I had a blast um I enjoyed everybody that I went with that community aspect as well um and birds are just really really awesome and so that's how I got into birding, but I did not know that it was a thing for a while. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and 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 also, quite frankly, I also went to Stagger World Lake when I went for the first time. I was just so amazed at just how many birds were in just one place. Because, like you, was like you know, what's the point? I mean, you just go there and you sit there and wait for birds to buy. Like I'm gonna take a note of what this is, but the experience is way different than what my assumption was what it could be. Because one, you're out there, you're just out there in nature, which already comes with a lot of like, ah, feeling good. And then you start paying more attention to your surroundings. You start paying more attention to the, the, the creatures that are moving about. And I think that is to me a big part of this thing. It's like, number one, you sort of like see yourself as a part of something much bigger than you are. 
that already feels belonging just for whatever mysterious reason you feel like oh this is this is work this is this feels like home somehow and then you get to witness all these beautiful creatures and their patterns and their behaviors. I, th I think it's, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, somebody said, we love Steiger World. Yeah, I'm so glad, Jess. We're gonna, gonna have to go all together one of these days and do this thing together. Okay, now in service of our timing, let's move on to our next question. What, what's your favorite burden experience and where was it? I have a feeling that maybe we've already touched a little bit about that, but maybe not. So. Most favorite burden experience and where was it? Who wants to take it on? Hmm. Is it was it was it you, Brenda, trying to chime in? All right, Brenda, please. Uh yeah, I just I, I think especially because right now I'm just thinking so much about my family and it happened this year. And I've been away from my family for like you know, because of the pandemic, but um, it didn't even happen to me, but my mom sent me a photo of a nest uh, that had some little eggs in it that was in a plant that she gave my sister um, when she moved to like her house. And it was just, it was just so cute because they were like, Brenda knows about birds. Let me send her this nest. And it just reminds like my nephews got to see them like, you know, fly away. And it just, they remind me of family. Like, it didn't even happen to me, but it just makes me so proud. Like I love like every time that I get to go take my nephews out and um, just be outdoors and it, it, it's just great every time. Mm. Yeah, I gotta say when you ask that question, I mine is, it goes back to family too. Um, I have two favorite moments and one is with my dad and one is with my mom. And with my dad, it, it was really special because I, my parents are from Mexico. And we went, went, we went back to Michoacan, the state that my parents are from. And we went to visit my grandpa. He was not doing well. But still, like, we, my dad made a little time for birding for me. He, he loves nature, but he doesn't know birds like I do. And he was just calling out all these bird names by their common names. And years later, after moving from Mexico to the U.S., he remembered these bird names. And that was just so special to me. It's just like, wow. My dad's so knowledgeable and impressive. And it just helps me connect birds to people you know migrations they're wonderful they're persistent they're just it's i love it and the second experience i have is with my mom um she goes birding with me as much as she can and i get lifers lifers are like new birds to my list because i do keep a list of birds and she helps me look for them i don't think she'll ever remember the names but she'll be like oh that pretty bird that looks like a chicken or that bird we saw a summer tanager in Chicago when I went to go visit a few springs ago and she just remembered how beautiful that bird was and it's imprinted in her mind and I think that's so wonderful. Mm, thank you Lily. You know it, it's, I, I'm finding it already interesting that it's sort of like it's starting to draw the notion of community and family. I love that you know for those of us who happen to be immigrants that idea of bird migration also carries kind of a, a, an extra bit of um, meaning. Uh, all right, uh, Sam, would you care to share your experience? Yeah, I feel like this question is so hard because um, I I love birding so like so much that I find joy in every every time I go. Um, but I have two as well. One of, one of them. So the thing about birding is that it's actually dangerous. <laughs> you are constantly like looking up or like around and you're not like watching where you're going at all and then like driving and birding is don't do that but anyway I was down in Malheur National Wildlife Refuge down in eastern Oregon and I was with my birding mentor um shout out to Tara um and she this like kills me and cracks me up all the time because we're driving down the road she was driving I was in passenger passenger seat and all of a sudden she's like, holy crap, slams on the brake. I almost like bust my face on the dashboard. And like, she's like, it's a short-eared owl, which is really fun. Uh, I was a lifer for me as well at the time. And it was just like sitting on this post, not, not 10 feet from us and like, let us take all these wonderful photos of it. And that place and that space is really magical in general. Um, and that moment was just so fun <laughs> and like really bonded me and me and my friend in that moment as well. 
Um, my other one is like, not necessarily a birding outing or anything like that, but I, the, the thing that I enjoy so, so, so much about birding and what I do with my podcast is when I talk to the people that I talk to um, and all of the BIPOC people that I've met and all of their stories about birding and like what they love about it and how they got into it. Um, I like couldn't think of anything else. I was like, wow, I really enjoy that actually the most right now. You know what? I'm If it's okay with you, Sam, because you do have that podcast and you've yeah. had the, the, so many of these stories, why don't you give us one of your favorite uh, stories from, from your podcast? Would you mind? Absolutely. Um, so, oh my, there's so many people. Um, well, I just, I just did a recording. This is like the behind the scenes inside scoop because it's an episode that's not out yet. Mm, y'all are lucky. Um, but <laughs> I just did a big group interview with um, a bunch of BIPOC leaders in their different communities who are, are leading birding outings for BIPOC people in different states. So Chicago, um, down in California, um, New York, New York, no, F Philly, and then Wisconsin. Anyway, so everyone was talking and there's this moment that happened a bunch about the leaders talking about when they take out um, uh, intergenerational families, burning and the the youth <laughs> and how they go in and they're like super shy the first time. And they're like, I don't know, there's a lot of adults around and I don't really know anything, but they keep coming back. And one of my favorite stories uh, is from my friend, um, Angel. And he, he made me cry actually, because this, uh, he's telling me about this kid came back and he was super shy at first, came back, came back, came back. And the last time he saw him, his parents or his family um, bought him hiking boots, a like hiking shirt, you know, the look, the gear and, and binoculars. And he was just so excited. And to me, that's the whole point is when you can bring that inner, like that generational level as well. Um, but with the, with the young ones, he was like five, you know, and get somebody so excited about something like that to where like, you know, he might not have found that if he, if my friend Angel didn't create that opportunity, right? So that was, I love that story. He made me cry. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Yeah, well, and, and, and that also illuminates something that is so important about how is it that we can make these spaces more accessible to everyone? You know, I think one of the, the biggest dissonance that I find in, in the work that I do in trying to open spaces for underrepresented communities to connect with nature in the way that they have, in a way that feels authentic to themselves, um, is that... A lot of folks have grown, for instance, going fishing, but a lot of folks haven't. A lot of a lot of folks have gone, grown up, you know, having memories of their parents going out hiking, but a whole lot of people haven't, you know. And so, uh, for some of us, this seems like second nature. Like, of course, everybody loves it, but we don't think often of how many times we need just that moment of entry just that moment of discovery that we can facilitate for some other folks, which is why it's so important that what you do, Sam, and what you, Brenda, you, Lily, and what you're doing right now, Jazz, just by being here with us, is just like opening that door just a tiny bit so that others can see the beauty that's on the other side uh, and just have that opportunity to just really fall in love with something. Um, ooh, okay, I see that you, but so let me start with Lily and then I'll move on to Sam again. Go ahead, Lily. Yeah, I think it's so interesting that you mentioned that, Mauricio, because um, I've met a lot of Latinos or Latinx folks who, folk who, their parents kind of fought them when they entered the world of field biology. It's like, my mom even told me myself, she's like, you're, you're going to do what your, your, what your dad left? Like, he left the campo, like, he's, like, he left the struggle. Why would you want to join that again? So it was hard, but I, in my heart, I knew I wanted to do it. And I'm like, I love it. I can make some money. I'll, I'll be fine. But yeah, it can be hard for us. Right, because to them, they also have their own association with what it may be. Sam? Um, yeah, so I think like um, something that I've, I've picked apart in my brain multiple times and on an episode is this idea that like for BIPOC people, um, there's different narratives, but there's a through through thread for most of us, right? And this, I, for me, this idea is when we're younger and whatever reason in our perspective cultures, there's something that like, I call it like snuffs out our flame. 
Um, something, someone along the way tells us we can't blank, right? When we're young, whatever that is, a person, an idea, whatever. And the amount of people that I've, I've like met recently who have found what, I don't know, one of my friends has coined called this the second spark, um, where you go out and birding is that for a lot of people where they go out and they rediscover how much they love being outside in whatever capacity. And then they also discover these awesome things that are outside called birds and doing these wild things that you never maybe had pay, paid attention to before. Um, and so that's why it's important to have that type of re representation in these communities in these spaces for BIPOC only, um, because, you know, we, we lose those opportunities really young sometimes. And so... Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to give ourselves that opportunity to have that either first spark or second spark show up. It may be birds, maybe something else, maybe reptiles. I'm not saying that Veronica might be in the audience somewhere. So hello there, Veronica. Uh, so I think I think that is so important. Um, and just to, to, to remember that there are some limitations that may be given by the surroundings or the context as some of those flame snuffers, as you call them, Sam, but then for every flame snuffer, I like to imagine that there's also a, a re-sparker, like we can be. And so I'm, 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 I'm uh, inspired and I'm also grateful that we have these opportunities to just have these conversations. And then perhaps in our audience today, or maybe someone who watches this recording at some point, maybe that someone say, like, you know what? I'm just gonna go out there to see what's out the window. Maybe I see some of those morning doves that Brenda and Lady keep talking about. Maybe I'll fall in love too. All right, all right. Ooh, is that is that you, Jazz, trying to get your word in? No? Okay, okay. It's okay, you can always, I know that you have a story packed there somewhere. So I'm gonna just poke for it at some point. All right, next, let's move into this third, dinosaurs, yes. <laughs> let's move on to this third question. Do you have, tips for a non-birder on how they can get into birding. Uh, and then you can even sp speak of, of your own experience. So uh, tips for non-birders and how they can get started. Who would like to take that on? Ooh, yeah, okay, Jess, let's bring that voice in here. Hi, so um, I was just thinking like tips for a non-birder, you could like, um, just start by looking out your window or just like going in your backyard mm -hmm. and then like start by going to parks and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It could, just, you, you, it could be just steps away. Okay. Now, Jazz, we know you're an expert on <laughs> all things. So why don't you tell me some of your favorite birds to look from outside your window? I like to look at the hummingbirds. Um, I like to look if the hawks and owls come by, then I like to look at them. And uh, sometimes when the eagles are out, but I also like to um, see the bush tits and then also the chickadees. The fact that you can identify so many of those, many more than I can already, I, we're going to have to get some private lessons there, Jess. What I like about the bush tits is like they all come together and it's really funny to see how they're all uh, kind of chasing each other for the food, even though there's lots of food out. Right, 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 right. So all those it's almost like siblings fighting for food. <laughs> it comes back to families, doesn't it? Like, ooh, I Always. see that group of people. That's my family, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, and Jazz is so right. Um, some, you know, people just see birds, they're like, oh, it's a bird, it's a bird. But if you start paying attention, you're like, oh, that's one kind of bird. And that's another kind of bird. And how many birds visit your ho home can be so amazing. It's like, whoa, I get like 10 different species here. Who would have thought? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Any other thoughts on tips for new birders or those who want to discover birding? Yes, Sam. Yeah, I think like um, um, one of my, I think, my biggest tip would just be to go wherever, out, stay inside, look out your window, whatever that means for you, because they're everywhere and you can always be part in. Um, and like, just don't, um, 
be patient with yourself as a learner because you'll get to a point where it'll be really frustrating when you realize how many species are out there, um, which is an amazing thing. But like IDing it can be really hard and difficult and there's no right or wrong way to do it. And you don't have to ID the bird. It's, you know, just like, it's just make it whatever works for you. It doesn't have to look a certain way. Oh, I love that. I love that. Not being prescriptive, just like enjoy the experience and then you can become more and find new things about it. That you can, okay, great. Larry says, find a place and sit <laughs> quietly. Lots of wildlife shows up. Thank you, Larry. Definitely. Brenda, what you got? Yeah, I was just going to say, I feel like it, it kind of starts like with what we're doing right now. Like for me, a lot of it was through just different groups um, and being able to go out with them. And so um, like, I remember one of my friends from an environmental class, like, he's the one that really got me into birds. And I was just borrowing his binoculars for a while. So um, that was really great. But um, even before I could get my own binoculars, um, a lot of visitor centers will actually lend you binoculars. So it's okay if like, you don't have the gear. Plus, a lot of apparently a lot of birding is done through like what you can hear too. So it's like, don't worry too much about gear um, or even books. There's like the free Cornell app or you could just like Jazz said or Jazz, uh, Sam said, um, you don't have to, I don't remember who said it. You don't have to um, ID it. You just make it what you want. Even if you just saw it and later on you look it up, like that works too. So um, yeah, like going out with others and knowing that there are ways for you to kind of test out gear while you're starting out. Mm, what I'm hearing you both, uh, Brenda and Sam, talk about is like, I, I and, and this goes to a lot of other things, which is like, you know, sometimes you don't want to try because you feel inadequate by not having the right gear or the right stuff. And I think what I'm hearing you both say is like, there is there is no such thing. You just need to go there and figure out a way that works for you and just whatever is enjoyable, then you're doing it right. That's amazing. Um, so, and I also saw there, Sherry, thank you for sharing. When you, Sam, were talking about just finding more of these spaces and opportunities for BIPOC or people of color to go out and explore. She brings about people of color outdoors, Pamela Slaughter, what an absolutely lovely soul. Uh, a yeah. delightful human. And I actually lead bird walks with them, so. Ah, yes. So definitely if you have an opportunity, if you want to look, check her out for sure. And Lily, here, you have a word. No, yeah, I was just going to piggyback off of of what Sam and Brenda say said, it's kind of intimidating to start bird watching, right? It's because you don't have the binoculars, maybe you don't have the field guide. Um, and that's why I just emphasize watching birds in your home and local parks and starting from there. Um, I love the Merlin Bird ID app. It's completely free and you can, you don't have to go ahead. You, you don't have to buy a field guide. Eventually, if you find that you really love birds and a field guide will take you so many different places, but Start with the Merlin Bird ID app and then just go from there. Yeah, test out those binoculars from different um, visitor centers. And I cannot emphasize how cool it is that we're offering bird walks with Sam because that is one way that I learned a lot of birds. I moved a lot throughout the US because I wanted to do a lot of different bird jobs. And you know, learning a new state and the different bird species in that state was hard. But when I was hanging out with the pros, it was, I like got in in a few months. Yes, and I feel, uh, and we have an active chat here. So please remember that we will be providing that link for those bird outings. So stick around. Um, either way, we'll make sure that you guys get those. Some additional uh, resources that have been posted in the chat. Ricardo posted a lovely quote that I'd like to read. I love this quote about birding. You can know the name of a bird in all languages of the world, but when you're finished, you'll know absolutely nothing whatever about the bird. So let's look at the bird and see what it's doing. That's what counts. I learned very early that the difference between knowing the name of something and just knowing something or knowing something. That's beautiful. Excellent. Jess. Yeah, um, we have a lot of these um, field guides about birds and um you can like find them at thrift stores or at garage sales mm -hmm. 
I love, love it. And, 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 and oh, go ahead, go ahead, Jess. I don't know if you have something else. We also have some like you can also get some posters to like identify the birds. Mm -hmm. um, there's also and another. I don't know exactly. Maybe you somebody in, in here knows. There's this app that you can take a picture of of things, and it'll and automatically do a data uh, search. There, those are those are amazing um, apps. Also to just spark your curiosity and just start to identify all the things around you. I mean, this this goes by iNaturalist. There you go. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there are so many resources out there and I'm hoping that those around you, if you happen to be someone who's never done it or you happen to be uh, not an adult, ask. There's so many things out there um, and there's always going to be, I'm hoping, around you someone who will be able to, to just fuel that curiosity in whichever way we can. Um, all right, let's see how we're doing in time. 47, so how about we... Uh, open it up to the audience to start sending in some questions for all of us and see what may be uh, things that we can answer for you. So um, just feel free to start putting some questions there. Otherwise, we'll be forced to start burning time with some special talents. I don't know what else what we have here. Bird calls. Bird calls. Ooh, maybe we can just do three. Just Not me. Others, maybe. Uh, excuse me, Sam. You brought it up. I want to take the best bird calls. <laughs> Hopefully, I won't have to. Jazz okay. is down. <laughs> All right, let's see. Do we have any? I think maybe. Here we go. Ooh, there's a call from Nancy. A lot of you are conservationists. What are the threats you're seeing to bird and bird migration? Pre specialized question. Who would like to take it on? That's, that's a tough question. Yeah. Um, that's something I know that my team with Fish and Wildlife Service are kind of um, trying to help with because we've lost a lot of birds, billions of birds, and it's kind of disheartening. Um, and I'm currently living in Colorado, and I will move to Portland soon. But uh, we had a, you know, a, a winter storm in September, and then we had the wildfires. And people were just seeing birds dying off left and right. And and then this, this year, people are like, I haven't seen birds, where are all the birds? I'm, I'm worried for them. And I try not to take it personally because it, it will make me very, very sad. But it seems that the biggest threats right now are windows. A lot of people hear a little thump on their window and they're like, oh, it's a bird. They go check it out and it flies away a few minutes later and everyone thinks it's fine. Typically not, it will fly away and die. So the best thing to do is to treat your window. I've had a few thumbs in my window and I created this little paracord curtain with it and stopped the thumbs, thankfully. Um, and another one, I know this one can be hard to do, but like creating a little habitat wherever you live. Uh, I don't live in a place where I have a yard. I had this little, I bought this little raised flower bed and I tried raising pollinator plants, but next year hopefully it goes better. Thank you, Lily. We all can be thoughtful about this. Uh, Jess, please. I'm not a conservationist, but um, one thing I noticed during the heat waves, Osprey, we watch every summer, uh, they lost their chicks because it was too hot. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jess. And I will say, I will challenge this idea that you're not a conservationist, um, Jess. Because the fact that you you care about watching birds, the fact that you are paying attention to what may or may not be happening to them, that already speaks of your ability to think about why they're here and why they matter in this planet, and by you know by proxy why it's important for us to take care of them. So, I'd say I'd say you're a conservationist, Jess. I'm gonna send you a certificate. <laughs> All right, we have uh, let's see, Angela it says. Uh, I visited Sicily and Italy in 2018. There were almost no birds on the seashore, no gulls, no sandpipers, not much bird, bird diversity in the city either. And I think we've seen trends that is really, really, you know, migration patterns are being disrupted by climate change and there are lots and lots of changes happening. And so, um, yeah, birds need food, bird needs places to rest when they're traveling for long uh, periods of time. And they, those places continue to disappear then we're creating a threat. Okay, Sam, please. Um, I think that one of the, the biggest things that you can do to help combat 
um, a lot of these issues um, is what Lily kind of already said, which is creating habitat and where you can. And I just want to plug that Portland Audubon has a great backyard habitat certification program um, where they help you figure out what plants are um, supposed to be here and which aren't and what helps with like wildlife um, um, flourish flourishing I don't know whatever word I want to use there um, but I think that's a big one for sure and then they also have a really great lights out program during migration because in, a big one besides global warming is that the city lights mimic certain like stars that are used to navigate and stuff like that and so just not keeping your lights on all the time especially past dark so there you go and again, just to, to, to re reiterate, you know, just because we are not some big organization doesn't mean that we cannot have an impact on how these creatures can survive and that we can help, um, you know, in so many ways. Brenda says, who's also here, <laughs> says, I think that is one of the beauties of birding is that it, it's, it is nice and fun, but at the end of the day, we also must just to want to protect them and the environment as well. We're all connected. That is a Hallmark postcard if I ever saw one. So uh, TM, thank you, Brenda. And <laughs> one more love for us. Yes, I heard someone come in. Brenda. Yeah, I think that that's one of the nice things too is that there are things that you can do even if you don't have a yard and things like that. Like I know I've learned um, just so much from other people that I'm friends with on social media that also love birds and like I remember I think Lily you shared uh like not putting up the fake spider webbing for Halloween just like little things that you learn and um like with birding you're just learning little by little and all of these actions they add up and um yeah Ooh, hold on so the little web uh for Halloween so did they just birds get trapped in there is that yeah. what happens Ooh, mm -hmm. I didn't know that uh, also, once again, there is a number of really useful resources that are being placed in the chat uh, from apps. I said that you put uh, the Seek app, Brenda. I know there were also some resources on what happens with windows and birds, Audubon habitat certifications, um, and a guide to wildlife uh, in friendly yards, um, and a few others. So I, I think probably would be worth for us to just compile all of this. And so as when we make the recording available, we can also have those ready, including of course, uh, Sam's podcast and website and ways in which they can join. All right, 7.54 on this date. Uh, not that it matters when it's recorded, but so you know, when you are watching this, it was 7.54 when I said that. Um, all right, do we have any other questions from the audience? Any other commentary that our lovely uh, panelists would like to share? Oh, wait, 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 yes. Question. Yes, what is, what is the question? Uh, ooh, ooh, I love that question. Is there a lesson you've learned from birds? That's a, that's a very good one. Yeah, again, I've learned two big lessons from birds. Um, they've helped me out a lot, which is kind of funny to say, right? But I mean it. One was they helped me connect to my roots. I remember one time I strayed away. I didn't like being Latina. I was like, no, I don't like the struggle. But then, I don't know. I was really excited when my dad was teaching me about birds in Mexico. So I slowly began to embrace. And also it brings me so much peace. I have to go on a bird walk every morning or else I notice that my my mental health kind of degrades so um yeah when I just go out in the morning and look for birds it's just I'm so at peace and I love it and it's something I wish to share with as many people as possible mm, that's beautiful thank you Lily Jess wanted to share one of the reasons why I like to go birding mm -hmm. um so I just like to go birding to see all the animals and birds around and um it also helps me escape, you know, like the stressful things in life. Mm -hmm. and then, um, sure. And being in nature, uh, helps me get by and get through things. And then, also, I heard this story about um, that if you're like kind of like 
near a tree or hug or like if you have a favorite tree and you're near that tree uh, it can make you happier like if you're near that tree at least uh, once a week or once a day mm-hmm. do you talk about hugging the tree uh, he, uh you can hug the tree if you want but if you just like don't like to uh like if you aren't comfortable with hugging a tree in public then you can just uh can just like read next to the tree there you go the picnic and, and you know ask the tree whether or not it feels like snuggling or not you know let's see how that works all right thank you jazz that's amazing sam um yeah i've learned a lot of stuff from birds and one of my favorite things to do is to um essentially like use nature and birds in particular to talk about or point out um how racism shows up in our world um and you wouldn't think that you could tie a lot of that back to the the birds but you can and it's actually really really interesting um and i i just i just love that so i've learned a lot of lessons in that way for sure Mm-hmm. I think there's something about one of the similar to what you were saying, Sam. If there's uh, anything that nature nature just shows us every day is just how important it is to have a variety of everything. Just how much beautiful everything is when you have as many colors, as many features, as many differences and ways of being unique in this world. Everything is so much better. So I think about that a lot when I think about the work of trying to bring everyone to experience all these other things, because that's it. The more, the more diverse, the more, the more things there are, the better we all are, the happier we can all be. All right. Uh, Brenda. Yeah, I will. I really love that. And I, it also does like a little bit of the unlearning too, right? Like I think that um, sometimes hearing about or learning about how bird behaviors might be different than human behaviors, like just makes it that so much more interesting. Like I, I love some of the um, kind of like role reversals that happen with like the male birds being brighter, just like the things that like, like that, that I think I can play with in terms of um, identity and things like that. So it's just like the un- the learning and appreciating of the diversity, but also like the unlearning of prescriptive like norms. I just, I love it. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, 7.59 folks. This is a conversation that I imagine. This, this, you know what, this really felt a little bit like just being in the living room with your friends and just having having all of us just being just talking about the things that makes us happy and I think this is really what it should be every time and so I invite you to have these conversations at home with your family with your friends you start exploring on your own and figuring out what this might look like for you however it works for you Um, I am told that this would be a good time to remind folks about this bird outings so we will be having uh, that, uh, and Nanette just posted in the chat. Thank you so much. You can join Sam for bird outing this weekend and, uh, and next. So there is a link to a Google Forms where you can type in your, um, your contact info and it would be amazing. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to checking back with you, Sam, to see how those go. And of course, send more folks your way. So I think it's wonderful. Excited. I hope you should come. Binoculars will be provided. What, what will be provided? You say burrito. binoculars. Oh, binoculars. I thought you said burritos. You got me with the binoculars. I might bring some breakfast burritos. I don't know. I'm, I am. I'm so there. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Product idea, binocular burritos. Boom. You know, Mauricio, <laughs> I'm here for it. Let's do it. Okay. Done. Lovely. Lovely. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, this is so great, Jazz. It was an absolute pleasure and a joy to have you here. And I so look forward to everything that's that's to come to you and your exploration of your passions in whichever shape they end up being. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to pass it back to Nanette.
Thank you, Mauricio. And thank you so much, Sam, Brenda, Lily, and Jazz for sharing your stories. I love them. I loved, um, it just made me have goosebumps. <laughs> you guys were so honest and engaging and passionate. So thank you so much. And thanks to the audience. I'm so glad to see you all join us and participate. And it was a great um, conversation also, also on the side in the, in the chat. So I'm happy that you all enjoyed it. And I'm gonna share my screen just to give you a little bit more information about the bird outings to make sure that you all can see that better or in, you know, in case you need to, um, hang on, let me make sure you see that. Um, so Sam, it has been great to offer this coming Saturday, November 13th, as well as the following Saturday, November 20th, um, it'll be bird outings. The first one at Whitaker Ponds from nine to 11, and the second one at Tualatin River National Wildlife Refuge, also nine to 11. So the link is in the chat, but it's also here in case you don't click on it right away, jot that down. Um, or if you um, don't get it, jot down our email down below, fw one Mygbirds, that's M-I-G-B-I-R-D-S at fws.gov. So you can send us an email if you have questions or weren't able to click on the link successfully and you really wanna um, do the bird outings. The space is limited because Sam really wants everyone who shows up to have a, a really good engaged opportunity. So sign up quickly, don't, don't hesitate. And um, binoculars will be provided. So don't worry about um, having the right gear. Just, just come with rain gear because you, you live in the Northwest. You know what it's like, right? <laughs> so um, again, sign up um, through Google Forms and ask us if you uh, send an email if you have questions. Someone mentioned the recording. And yes, we are doing a recording. If you didn't register by email, um, email us down below and we'll be sure to send you the link once we have it all, all finalized. So thank you again, everyone. And um, please enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Great, thank you.